Okay, perfect. We can start. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank you, everybody, to 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 be here. Uh, to the all the participants, I would like to thank you to Professor uh, Gerlag for being here. I will present in a couple of minutes. In order to start our uh, Listo seminar, I remember that this uh, uh, Listo seminar is economic modeling seminars. Uh, we started uh, in December with Professor Pindaik. Uh, after we had uh, Professor uh, Hill. After in December, uh, Professor Svart, uh, we restarted in January with uh, Professor Toll, uh, Ber Professor Bergman in uh, February, and uh, in February also Professor Christian Gollier. And the last, uh, the last week was also Professor um, Rick van der Plog. Uh, to have, today we have the pleasure to have here Professor Gerlag. I remember that uh, the next uh, uh, seminar will be on April with Professor Konduri, Phoebe Konduri and April 8th. And uh, I remember that this economic modeling seminar is uh, organized by Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economists, University of Brescia and Fondazione Enrico Mattei with the collaboration of uh, uh, European University Institute, Università di Siena, uh, the Department of Environmental Science and Policy of University of Milan and the uh, Department of Economics and Management of University of Padua. I remember that uh, this uh, list of seminar is uh, uh, managed to, in order to, uh, um, to have uh, the most important economists on political economy and, and energy and environment, uh, especially speaking about uncertainty and uh, social uh, welfare. This is a pathway, this pathway is a pathway that we would like to converge uh, uh, towards uh, the, uh, in our conference uh, in April. The conference is, this, process, this pathway is called the Road to uh, Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economies 2021. This is our poster. Uh, the conference will be held in uh, uh, 21 uh, and 22 and 23 of April and uh, is organized uh, uh, virtually, so it's an online conference, but visually is organized by the University of Brescia and Fondazione Enrico Mattei with the help uh, and uh, supported by all these organizations and firms. And with I we thank you a lot. Uh, in uh, the next uh, uh, conference, uh, the keynote, the, our keynote speakers will be uh, the Professor uh, William Nordhaus, Nobel Prize in Economics 2018. He's, uh, is uh, organized for uh, April 10 to 1 at 4 o'clock, and also Professor Robert Pindijk, uh, April 22 uh, at 4 o'clock. We are also organized a side event on 23 of April, but we will give you more uh, information in the next. So today I have a pleasure to have here Professor uh, Rier Gerlag. So I have to, to, to thank a lot uh, Professor Gerlag to give uh, his to, it's time to us in order to present this paper. The title is Special Interest in Climate Policy. Professor Ray Geller is Professor of Economics at Tilburg School of Economics and Management. His research and the topics of his research are devoted to uh, climate economics, sustainability, exhaustible resources, environmental policy and trade, technological change, and cost environmental policy. And uh, uh, about uh, his uh, most important, so uh, as uh, you know, his, uh, his CV is very long, so I have taken some important uh, uh, points. So from 2011 and 2014, he was coordinating lead author of the uh, fifth assessment report of the IPCC. He's uh, associated with uh, an ERI, INRI and the Energy Economist, a member of the editorial board of the JEEM, with our uh, three most important uh, um, review of uh, our uh, topics. Uh, it was a head of economics department of uh, between 2015 2019, jointly uh, with uh, Jane Bone in uh, Tilburg. In 2001, he received a prestigious grant uh, by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research, Research for his innovative research. And among a lot of uh, uh, different awards, I have taken uh, these two that are 20, uh, 2000. In, uh, um, 16 on uh, Jim's best, best paper and 2003 on Energy Journal Best Paper Award. About his uh, research, uh, I have taken also in this case some representative uh, um, um, uh, journals uh, that are Journal of Economic Theory, European Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Journal, Journal of Environmental Economics and Management, uh, Journal of Public Economics, and, and among others, so there is also Journal of Economics Dynamics and Control, Energy Economics, Ecological Economics, and that are uh, 57 papers. 
uh, is also in the uh, in the ideas uh, ranking is uh, among the top uh, fifth, uh, five uh, percent authors, uh, especially ranking among the top in energy economics and environmental economics. So uh, it's a pleasure for uh, having here Professor uh, Rayer Gerlag. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, Special Interest Climate Policy. Now I leave the floor to him. I would like to thank you, him, uh, for this. Uh, thank you, everybody. And remember that if you want uh, to uh, make some questions uh, during the presentation, it's possible to write uh, in our chat. Uh, and so I, we can send it to professors so you can write them to answer to you. And so uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I disappear and leave the floor to Professor Gerd. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is paper, joint work with uh, Matti Liskoy, Matti Liski from uh, Aalto University. We've been working on it already quite some time. Now, so this is quite a loose introduction. Uh, I saw this crop recently. I've been working on separate projects on EU ETS prices and uh, uh, what struck me the last time I saw this was this huge price hike in the last month. Now, um, you, most of you probably are familiar with the price developments of the EU ETS uh, for emission allowances, the drops after the finance crisis, the credit crisis and the debt crisis, the revision of the market stability reserves with the price rise. And now we see a price rise from 25 to 40. So the prices currently are at the highest level ever seen. Now, historically, we tend to think of fundamentals changing the prices of the ETS. And the question is what's going on here? Now, I won't make a very strong case, but um, what this sort of this paper partly is about is what are fundamentals for the price? It's not only fundamentals in the stalemate economic sense, but also maybe fundamentals about climate change, climate policy uh, credibility. So the question we'd like to ask in this paper is what drives climate policies? And we'd like to look a little bit further than the basic. So what are the basics? The basics is that's uh, from Nordhaus that uh, you can see, uh, you'll see at the IEA uh, conference coming soon. Uh, from North House, the model, the dice model, we know that in an optimum, the carbon prices should be equal to the marginal damages. And marginal damages increase with the temperatures, they increase with the income. And there's a nice paper by Gauss et al. 2014 in Econometrica, where they have that formula I will show later, where you directly see how carbon prices rise with income. Uh, obviously, because it's the net present value marginal damages that matter, the price will also, optimal carbon price will also rise with a decreasing real interest rate. Now, in this paper, we don't look at these sort of fundamentals. We look at other types of fundamentals. Let's under the label political economy. So we want to look at how do economic interests shift and what are the fundamentals of these economic interests? How do these fundamentals of economic interests in climate change policies how do they change over time? That's the topic of this paper. So to get you a basic feel of what we want to think about, uh, maybe you recall that there is quite a literature on trade and why trade uh, is often, uh, the industries that are exposed to trade are often protected, especially when the industry is in decline. And one of the arguments that has been made in the literature is that declining industries, they have a rent because they, there is no entry and entry of new industries, of new firms tend to dissipate rents. But there's in that case of a declining industry, no entry of new firms. So the existing firms have their capital and they just want to generate output with that capital and that produces rents for these. And these rents give these industries an incentive to directly lobby at the regulator to protect their interests. Now, once we see that mechanism at work in trade, it's only a small step to understand that we have similar mechanisms at work in energy and climate contexts. Because in energy climate, there are very large, substantial Ricardian resource rents. Think of fossil fuels, where the difference between the price and the cost of extraction is a pure resource rent. Think of renewable energy, where the gap between the price of, for example, for electricity 
and the marginal cost of producing one unit of electricity, which is close to zero, is a pure rent. Think of biofuels, also generating huge rents. And importantly, the rents that these energy sources generate depend on policies, on climate change policies. So uh, an example of that is the US Energy Act. I think 2005, where I wrote a paper about uh, with uh, Richard James recently, increasing the rents of the corn uh, farmers in the US. Now, if policymakers can be rewarded for their support for these resource rents, then we have a mechanism that can also tell us something about the fundamentals of climate energy policies. So what do the data suggest? Here we simply look at worldwide data and we see that uh, over the past decades, the rent of for fossil fuels has been substantial. So Cody et al. and the uh, International Energy Agency estimate that energy subsidies make a very substantial share of worldwide GDP. So Cody et al. even estimate 5%. And for fossil fuels, these subsidies are much larger than the subsidies for renewables, but for renewables, they are rising quite rapidly. So the question is, why are there these huge subsidies for fossil fuels? Will they vanish over time? Uh, and how does it come that they are there even this, despite the climate concerns we have? So the overall research question of this paper is, how do climate concerns and energy lobbying interact with each other? And how does their interaction shape energy policies? Then we want to also apply that empirically. Can the model explain these very slow decrease in fossil fuel subsidies? Can it explain the increasing subsidies for renewables with increasing income? We see that higher, richer countries have typically larger renewable subsidies. And if we use a model that sort of can fit these empirical uh, findings, these stylized facts, can it help us to understand what we should expect for the future when the climate concerns will increase and what will that imply for the expectations for energy policy? Please uh, let me recall that uh, you can ask questions if I'm going too fast uh, straight away, for example, at the chat box. So what do we do to answer these questions? We develop a principal agent model that describes lobbying by the energy industry over energy policies. And that lobbying is superpositioned on top of climate change concerns of the central planner. The model we want to develop is dynamic, but despite being dynamic, it will have nice closed form or pseudo static properties. It will be, you can solve the model completely fully recursively. So recall from the Goddess of it all paper in Econometrica that they had this nice formula that the social cost of carbon equal to the carbon tax was just proportional to income with a constant G. So in their model, income growth drives carbon pricing. We will find similar results in our model. So we precisely characterize the equilibrium with lobbying, so with the energy industry influencing the policies, and we do that period by period, that is recursively. And what we find basically is that if you have a large fossil fuel sector, then indeed effectively the fossil fuel sector will lobby against carbon prices. If you have an emerged renewable sector, then this one will effectively lobby in favor of renewable subsidies. Now, this may sound sort of obvious, but in the end, I hope you'll see that still this does affect our view on what we expect for how the future will look like. So um, we build basically on two strands of literature. The first strand of literature is the analytical climate economy models. Uh, I mentioned a few here. And the second strand is the menu auctions models, that is the um, principal agent type of model. And what we contribute is first on this trend, on the analytical climate economy models, we extend the domain to which that type of models can be applied. 
On the menu auction type of models, we expand that literature by having a very non-trivial dynamic menu auction model. And then combining the two, we think that sort of uh, applying the model, we also develop, pre present a new perspective on what to think of the reference or the business as usual climate change policy. So our model can potentially help us understand why we are slow with carbon pricing and how we can extrapolate the observations from the past to the future. So the model is analytic. It has competitive final goods sector, meaning that there are no profits in the final goods. There are two energy sectors, a dirty and a clean one, and they have decreasing returns to scale, which means that they generate rents for the owners of the fixed sector. And then the energy sectors can reward the policymaker for policies that favor their profits, their rents. Now, the policymaker then maximizes general welfare plus income from the rewards received from the industry sector. So that causes a distortion in the optimum policy. And then we add to that, so this is the typical uh, menu auction model. And then we add to that the climate change dynamics from the cost of it all type of model, where we have emissions causing a dynamic response in damages. Now, today, I will not include capital in the discussion. The reason is that basically capital plays no role in a certain way. And I will be specific about that later on. Uh, capital, in my view, plays no role in the DICE model. It does not play, plays no role in the Goddess of all model. And obviously, we know that even though, in, as I will explain what I mean by this, it plays no role, it's still included in these models. So maybe that should actually be a reason for us to include capital in the paper. Currently, we have no capital. So how does the model look like? We have to find a good constant returns to scale, and that is all consumed. So because we have no capital, there is no investment over here. Final good is produced using labor as an input and dirty and clean energy. Dirty and clean energy are using a fixed factor that's causing the decreasing returns to scale for both, and they are using intermediates produced by the final good. So then we add to that, that's the base model of production. We add to that climate change. Dirty energy production is basically fossil fuels that changes the climate and climate change reduces total factor productivity for both the final good and for both energy sectors. And then we add to that a planner who not only maximizes welfare, but also who regulates the taxes or the subsidies, the green arrows for both energy sectors, but who also can receive transfers from both sectors. And the transfers determine the objective of the plan. So the policymaker maximizes welfare plus income from rewards. So that is here the menu auction element we introduce in the climate economy model. Now I want to take a step back because um, uh, I can sort of present all the, uh, all, the, all the equations and try to explain the model in detail and you'll find it becomes fairly complicated. And instead of that, what I want to do is I want to sort of provide the history, the context of our model, so that you understand where we come from, how we sort of derive the properties, and then I'll be shorter on the details of the model itself later on. But then hopefully you understand that though it looks complicated at a, a meta level, it's actually uh, not that complicated. So um, we go back a long time, about almost 50 years, and uh, 1972, and we look at the Brock Merman model. So they developed a model with discrete time, with a cup Douglas production function, and importantly here is the cup Douglas for capital, with full capital depreciation. So there is uh, the capital stock of the next period plus consumption is equal to output and separable lock utility. Now, this model with these features 
has the property that it generates constant savings rates as the optimum, which can be interpreted as the equilibrium. And importantly, uh, uh, and from an analytic perspective, that's important. Um, you find that utility at any point in time is log linear in the state space in the capital stock. Plus some term here, the U bar, and the U bar contains all kinds of technology elements, such as the total factor productivity over here. That applies to utility at any point in time. It also applies to welfare at any point in time. So and what this tells us is that the model itself is conceptually forward looking. So the households or the planners, they maximize the, in, the infinite stream of future utility. It is history dependent. So the past decisions on the capital stock affect current consumption and output. But by choosing the neat parametric forms, Brock and Merman succeed to formulate a model such that it has a complete recursive solution. Once you've got the capital stock at time t, you know the production level, then you know how much is invested in capital in the next period, and you can just project the model forwards. So it is forward looking, but it can be solved recursively. And that's a very nice, very neat feature of that model. Now, what Collis of it all, Collis of Hassler, Grussell, and Sivinsky in 2014 did in the Necromatica is they took that approach and they extended it to the DICE type of model. They added climate change to that broad murmur model. So, what did they do? They added total factor productivity depending on climate change. They made sure that the production function remained cut backwards in, cut in capital. They made sure that the productivity was exponential linear in past emissions. And then because of these features, the utility became also log linear in past emissions and the social cost of carbon became proportional to output. So I'm not going to the details. The point I want to emphasize here is that they, again, they keep the same sort of framework as Brock Merman. They have a model that is forward looking. That's conceptually how the model sort of can be understood. Past emissions determine the present. So it's not a dump dynamic model, it's really dynamic. But still all decisions, for example, decision on capital, it is the same constant savings rate as in Brock Merman. So capital decisions are separable from climate policy conditions. And we have a neat climate policy rule that can be solved recursively. So in this model by Carlos of it all, you take the state of the climate, you take the amount of capital, and you can calculate for that specific period in which you start what the savings rate will be, and you can calculate what the carbon tax will be. And then you can just project, put it into the state of the climate for the next period in the state of the capital stock for the next period, and you can solve it for the next period. So it's a need, you can solve it in an Excel file, so to say. Now, those of you who would like to understand that more in detail, I have set up a series of, uh, I call it lectures because I also use it for uh, research master students uh, that uh, are available for anyone to watch. And I'm, I'll be very happy if you'd like to get feedback on that. So to explain more in details how the connection between the different models work. So what do Matti and I do in our paper? So we then take it one step further. So we take the goddess of it all model and then we add an energy industry that has rents from both clean and dirty energy production. We add lobbying, that is the energy industry can transfer part of their profits, their rents to the planner. And then as much as that, so whereas here, uh, Goddess of it all used the lock exponential damage function. Here we consider a specific class of transfers. And then we show that within this class of transfers, we keep exactly the same uh, utility 
separable uh, utility function, separable in capital and emissions as follows of it all. So why is it relevant? We again have a model where even lobbying for energy subsidies is completely forward-looking, where past emissions affect the present intensity of lobbying, where capital decisions are separable, and therefore I leave them out in today's presentation, and where you can solve this lobbying equilibrium completely recursively. So we can characterize the equilibrium in relative straightforward terms. So let's give the details now here. We have discrete time, we have a dirty fossil fuel sector, and we have a clean uh, sink of renewable energy sector. The relevant history is because we leave our capital here is only the fossil fuel use and fossil fuel use is the same as emissions from the dirty industry, uh, the energy produced by the dirty industry. Then we have uh, climate damages, which have the same functional form as in colors of it all, generically. So in a paper by Mati and me in GA, we present what we believe is a uh, more appropriate specification of these parameters, theta, compared to the original in Gauss of Dahl, by the way. Um, and where welfare is recursive, as in the original Brock Merman model. So this is basically the entire model from a technology and, pers and preferences perspective. Extremely simple. Now, one element to have in mind is that here the energy sector, which we didn't specify how it precisely looked like here. So here we just say there is a general production function consisting of energy and labor. In the details, we give it a bit more flesh. We say that there is some constant elasticity of supply, sigma. And that means that there is a markup. Uh, not, it's not a markup. That's the costs of producing the energy source are only a share of the value. So mu is the price of energy. So mu times E is the value of energy output by each industry. It can be dirty or clean. C are the cost of producing. And so the rents is the difference between revenues minus costs. And that is a fixed share of the value of energy. Having defined all this, uh, an equilibrium is simply defined as for any set of uh, taxes for uh, the dirty and the clean sector. So here we can think of carbon taxes. Here we can think of, for example, renewable subsidies if tau is negative. A competitive equilibrium is simply an allocation supported by prices where all the firms maximize profits and the consumer maximize utility. And we want to keep in mind that from the regulator's perspective, um, choosing, or choosing the taxes or choosing the levels of energy are completely equivalent. That's the quantity prices equivalence if you have certainty. Now, so given this simple setup, uh, we state explicitly that we have the same feature as in the Gauss of Adal model, that in the social optimum, so that's important, we are now here looking at the social optimum, not at an equilibrium, but at the social optimum. Utility is log separable or is just linear separable and welfare is also linear separable. Why is this sort of insightful? You can, once you see this, you realize that the current planner maximizes current consumption, utility from current consumption, plus next welfare from next period. Then you see that next welfare depends on the emissions, and you can directly derive from this that in the first last, the marginal productivity of dirty emissions of fossil fuels should be equal to output. That's because of the logarithmic utility multiplied by the terms here, which are exactly the terms there, which is the lack structure of how emissions affect climate change damages in the future. 
So this is the social optimum, but we are ultimately not interested in the optimum. We are interested in a lobby equilibrium. So we are now looking at the policy gain. So the decision maker in power at time t receives a transfer, capital T, from the interest groups, which are the energy industries, and then maximizes welfare. So these are the transfers from the energy industry to the planner. So this is the overall consumption by the planner, and the planner maximizes utility from cons current consumption plus next period welfare, assuming that next period the planner will not anymore be in charge, so he will become a normal citizen. Now the energy firms maximize profits. Profits are current profits plus the net present value of future profits are simply the discount factor minus obviously the cost of paying the transfers to the planner. The theta over there is then the effectiveness of the planner. So if you can easily transfer money from the industry to the planner, theta will be large. If sort of uh, money uh, is spilled alongside the transfer, then theta is small. Now the equilibrium, the typical menu auction type of equilibrium, goes as following. The industry decides on an offer. So the industry tells to the central, to the regulator, to the planner, the policymaker, if you choose, given the, given the history, if you choose a certain level of energy use, you will receive a certain transfer. And then, so the industry decides on the menu of possible offers, transfers, and then given that menu, the decision maker decides on what actually the emission levels or the energy levels will be implemented. And obviously it can be made completely equivalent either choosing energy levels or using policies in terms of uh, taxes or subsidies. So, how does this work in a bit more detail? The policymaker, uh, so we look backward, we solve typically the game backwards. So, the policymaker receives the offer menu for possible transfers and then chooses the optimal energy levels or equivalently uh, tax levels. Then, going back one step, the industries decide what kind of offer they will, what kind of offer they will make such that the policymaker chooses the preferred emission uh, energy levels. Now, this is a bit, the manual auction literature is technically a bit complicated. So here I try to give an intuition of uh, how the equilibrium looks like. So what happens is the policymaker is always free to accept or not the offer by the industry. So the policymaker can always implement the one-shot optimum, setting the carbon price equal to the social cost of carbon. The energy industry making the offer understands that the policymaker can reject the offer. So the energy industry understands that he has to compensate the policymaker for any deviation from the one-shot optimum. Now, there is a surplus if you look at the combination of the policymaker and the energy industry, because the energy industry can increase the profits uh, if the policymaker, for example, subsidizes energy use. And part of these profits then can be transferred to the policymaker. And it's possible that the policymaker then sort of can be more than compensated for the welfare losses because the policymaker receives specifically individually the transfer, while the other people do not receive the transfer. So the combination industry plus policymaker can increase their joint uh, welfare utility. There is some surplus. Now in a truthful reward schedule, all the surplus goes to the policymaker, which is in the literature called the agent. And then the equilibrium finds the efficient allocation from the point of view of the pair 
principal agent, that's the pair energy industry policymaker. So, and given that general characterization of a truthful equilibrium, you can uh, generalize, you can characterize a truthful reward schedule in this way. This is somewhat technical, so I'll skip it, I'll leave it there. Given all these elements, you can define the Markov perfect equilibrium, uh, which is just the equilibrium where everyone behaves optimally given whatever all the other agents in the model do. And then the smart thing, like comparable to whereas Dolosov et al, they have the log exponential damage function, that was their smart sort of functional form. The smart functional form that we implement this year, we say, we look at the class of transfers, which are also linearly homogeneous. So I won't again go into details. I just want to point out, this is sort of a parametric, it's not even a parametric, it's, an, uh, it's a choice about the class. And this choice will allow us to solve the model in very simple ways. Because we can show that if a market perfect equilibrium exists, where transfers are homogeneous, then we must preserve the same properties from the uh, lock from the linear utility. The only difference will be the terms here. So the constants, or not the constants, the uh, sort of state of the world in the, the independent utility levels. So an equilibrium with lobbying looks exactly the same as, as the optimum equilibrium, apart from that the level of utility is lower or higher. That's the difference in the terms here and the difference in the terms there. So this lemma is conditional on existence. The lemma itself does not show that the equilibrium actually exists. And so the important thing is that it says that if it exists, it looks very much like the social optimum. Then uh, we have another property which says that if there is an homogeneous uh, equilibrium, then we can prove that the rents are proportional to TFP and that through a whole chain of difficult mathematical complications tells us that um, the value of the firm in the future is strictly proportional to the current outcome. So this is a feature that is in some way resembles the constant G at the carbon price policy functions of Carlos of all. And then in the end, after all difficulty looking mathematics, this is what it, uh, what is, uh, what, it, what it boils down to. And this is what's the important ultimate conclusion is that there exists a unique equilibrium and it can be solved recursively and it looks very much like the standard equilibrium you have here you maximize the lock of consumption but there is here an additional term which is the value of the energy industries in the future and there is here an additional term which is the profits of the energy industries so what this theorem simply tells is that the lobbying equilibrium or the equilibrium where the industries can lobby, they will distort each period the use of energy such that the profits of the industries increase by a certain amount and the CETA captures how strong the distortion is because this part up, this part is exactly the same as in the original cost of the model. Yeah, so the equilibrium the social optimum is distorted, and that's this green part, towards increasing the rents for the energy industry. And if there is a large fossil fuel sector, then the distortion will be large favoring fossil fuels, that is reducing carbon prices or even subsidizing fossil fuels. If there's a large renewable sector, then there will be a large subsidies for the renewable sector. So this just is the details of that, but I think uh, it might be more interesting to go through the quantitative results. So 
I hope that this so far may have looked all extremely difficult and abstract, but here uh, I hope it sort of gets some more uh, flesh. Uh, so what do these lines present? They present the size of the, uh, the distortion, the size of the excess subsidy or excess uh, difference in the carbon tax relative to GDP. So this point over here says that the model calibrated to the year 2000, the models calibrated such that in that year, the carbon price was so far below the social cost of carbon that the gap had a value. So the gap multiplied by the amount of fossil fuels had a value of 1.5 percentage of GDP. And because the fossil fuel sector as a share of the economy declines over time, it also, the uh, gap starts to decline over time. <clears throat> and as the fossil fuel sector over the 21st century completely declines, so the uh, gap also completely moves out. So by the end of the century, this mechanism says, if there is no fossil fuel sector left, there is also no interest anymore in distorting the carbon price. As simple as that. Here, the model says, if the renewable energy sector is small, then there will be some incentive still for renewable subsidies. But the moment the renewable energy sector becomes larger, actually the incentives increase to subsidize uh, renewable energy. So with a larger renewable energy sector, the subsidies for renewable energy increase and by 2050, the economy is distorted in favor of renewable energy against fossil fuels. That's what the crossing at 2050 tells us in this model. So what does that mean uh, in terms and practical terms like carbon prices? So the dashed green line is the social cost of carbon in our calibration. So you see we have quite a modest and we calibrated the model uh, three years ago, four years old already almost. So we have parameters with a modest carbon price of uh, that would currently be about 25 euro per ton CO2. And um, that's the social cost of carbon, the dashed brown line. And then the model says that this is the gap. So this is sort of the implicit subsidy that the fossil fuel industry would like to pay for to be implemented by the policymakers. So this model tells that with these parameters, actually, currently the carbon prices for a worldwide average would be at about zero and then would start to rise rapidly from the present onwards. At the same time, uh, in this calibration, the subsidies for renewables would currently amount to about 40 euro per ton CO2 uh, that's prevented equipment. How does that translate into emissions? That's this graph. Now, the dashed blue line is the line with zero taxes. Now, importantly, here we do not call that scenario the business as usual, because in a certain way, in our model, the black line is the business as usual, because our model explains why in the past there were no carbon prices. So our model says that in the past there were actually carbon subsidies. And that's why emissions in the past were above the level that would have been there if there were zero carbon prices. Currently, we are at the level where on average, carbon prices are zero. So the current uh, emissions are about at a level equivalent to zero taxes. But in the future, the carbon taxes will start to rise. That's this year. And as the carbon taxes start to rise and renewables remain to be subsidized, oh, oh, I'm going the wrong way, emissions will start to drop off in the future. And notice here this point by 2070 in our model, uh, emissions will even drop below the social optimum level because by that point, uh, taxes combined with subsidies for renewable, the subsidies for renewables are so high because of the interest of the renewable sector that um, we have 
we have lower less emissions than what is social option. So we're almost there. So let me try and summarize. Um, the question that we want to address is how do climate concerns and lobbying interact when shaping, shaping climate policies? So we find that interest groups induce subsidies. That sort of that's relatively straightforward to describe in a model. And, and that's sort of, I have not emphasized that, so I'll go back. That amplifies the effect of externality pricing. So what is sort of special, uh, what is the silver lining in this graph is that our model sort of uh, describes that originally you will have higher emissions than what is optimal. So green is optimal. Black is the equilibrium. So you'll start with more emissions than what's optimal. But then once the transition starts to set in, you actually move faster than optimal. So uh, the effect of social optimum carbon prices on emissions is accelerated, amplified by uh, lobbying. So that is the interaction effect that we identify. Um, so the model, because of the mechanisms we described, is sort of able to describe the uh, stylized finding that uh, fossil fuels have been subsidized in the past and that we see that uh, fossil fuels sort of decrease with income and that subsidies for renewables increase with income that's consistent with the model. And uh, the model then predicts that if that these are indeed the mechanisms at play, then uh, we do expect a slow initial uptake of climate policies. But once climate policies sort of start to get a hold, once the renewable energy sector becomes uh, more uh, mature, then we expect an acceleration uh, with increasing income for renewable energy policies. So coming back to this graph, um, are these high prices that we've observed over the last month, are they there to stay? Well, um, in a certain way, I'm optimistic. I think, yes, they will. And why is that? Well, so in the line of our paper, if you think about the big, even the big car companies like Volkswagen have now sort of stated that they want to move towards electric vehicles. Then once they have these electric vehicles on a large scale at households, they will actually benefit from renewable energy because electric vehicles can be a storage of the intermittent energy. So there will be all kinds of uh, the incentives for the firms will change from the big fossil fuel companies or fossil fuel dependent companies who would like to delay current pricing to new companies uh, even car companies with electric vehicles that would like to incentivize more renewable resources because more renewable resources will make their car batteries even more valuable for the households. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'd like to thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation, I have to say. And also because uh, is a uh, I think uh, is uh, perfectly aligned with a debate that there is uh, in this case, uh, is also here about environmental fiscal reform in general, and also environmental harm from subsidies, because uh, you touch exactly you touch exactly this point in which uh, raise this uh, um, this strange situation which we have uh, maintaining. I have to say also in Italy we have 20 billions uh, um, of. Uh, uh, Euro uh, of environmental harm from subsidies. Each year there is this discussion in order to reduce uh, or to reuse uh, this uh, environmental harm from subsidy in order to you know, push or to, tra to transform uh, in, uh, in uh, environmental green subsidies. And uh, I have to say that every time uh, there is a, uh, can I say, a stop in, in, the, in the project, in political, uh, on the political aspect. I, I, I found that here a special interest could be uh, one uh, reason in which there is this kind of uh, of safety situation. Another important point is that you are adding also uh, more um, you uh, you Ria and also Matti, your uh, co-author. We are uh, um, adding also an important uh, 
new explanation and also a project for the future that they also add in, in literature as far as i know so far i read some papers which there is a but on the uh, investment part of view so in which uh, it's possible to discuss on uh, this strange situation, which is sometimes you can uh, add, uh, for example, with a paper on eco labeling, uh, that they can uh, push uh, green investment, but at the same time, with uh, as uh, this kind of uh, uh, strange uh, uh, behavior in which uh, a, a, a firm that uh, can invest uh, in the two direction, green and brown, on the gray and, uh, and green uh, investment in, in in brown or gray can also push. Uh, sorry, investment in in eco labels, so, uh, green can also push also brown. I think it's also inside, the, including this uh, point of view. But uh, now I open this question to all other um, um, participants that I thank again. Now you know that there is uh, uh, Simone Borghese, professor of uh, University of Siena, European University Institute, that would like to, to, to speak and to, to make a question. So, Simone. Sergio, hi, Ryer. Great to see you and thank you for your presentation. Lots of ideas uh, listening to your presentation. I will try to summarize them in a couple of general questions and one more uh, technical one if you would. My first question is, you show us that beyond 2070, the level of emissions might be lower than socially optimal, right? Uh, I was trying to reconcile this with uh, climate neutrality by 2050. Suppose we are, suppose, for the sake of the argument, that we achieve climate neutrality as, as promised, then uh, what would uh, emissions below social optimal mean uh, in concrete terms? Uh, my second question is more of a comment, but uh, I cannot resist because you show us at the end the ETS price, and you know I, I care very much for that. and. Uh, your opinion is that these high prices will probably escape. But my question is, do you think they will keep growing? Because again, if we look at climate neutrality, then probably it's not enough that they stay uh, up to 40 euros, but they should uh, increase even more to reach this ambitious target. And then I have a couple of uh, very fast uh, more technical questions on the model. Uh, the first one is you distinguish between dirty and clean energy sectors. Um, how would the results change or uh, would they be affected if you had someone belonging to the dirty sector that can play a role in the clean sector as well? So imagine someone has a dirty technology but also a clean technology and can affect the optimal transition path from the one to the other. And, and finally, and then I shut up, uh, what's the role of the uh, non-separable uh, utility function that you assume how the non-separability can affect the results? That's, that's not a critique, actually, I, I like it and I tend to use it as well, but sometimes that's a question that reviewers ask me. How are your results affected by this assumption? So, uh, your answer will uh, enlighten me on, on how to answer myself. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Simona. Um, on the first question, so uh, we, uh, we we say our emissions even go below optimum by 2070, and then you and then sort of you are so polite not to say, but hey guys you still have positive emissions in the optimum. That's a bit weird. Uh, so thank you for being so polite. Uh, now, so I let me first admit, I struggle myself with the concept of optimality. So uh, what is optimal? Um, first of all, I really do hope that Europe achieves climate neutrality by 2050. I really think we have to try and I think we can do it. So I do hope we try and achieve it. I do not expect in all honesty that the world will achieve the same. So China aims for climate neutrality by 2060. And I think that, uh, well, the rest of the world, we should be extremely happy if they aim for climate neutrality by 2018. So, um, 
I think that overall climate neutrality by 2080 would be an enormous achievement. And uh, so in other meetings uh, for lay people, I explained to people that I expect that by 2050, we will start solar radiation management. So I say, we're gonna, it's getting too warm here. We're gonna protect our earth from the sun, shooting dust into the stratosphere. We'll start develop technologies to, uh, with a hoover to capture the CO2 out of the air and to try to get rid of it in other ways. That's, in my view, almost unavoidable. So I have somewhat a bleak view on how the future will be go. Yeah, you may say it's pessimistic. So in that context, it's rather difficult to sort of keep straight thinking about what's optimal. Huh? Now, so we have that problem of what is optimal. So what do we do? In a certain way, in our model analysis, we sort of copy the standard optimality damage, the standard damage functions huh, that is typical for these models. And then you get results that I may say myself, well, you know, I have some troubles with it when I ask myself ethically whether that's optimal or not. But you know, as a researcher, I cannot the whole time make ethical, uh, uh, engage in ethical discussions. At some point I have just to pick a parameter that I believe most of my colleagues sort of will accept as a working parameter. So that's how we come with positive emissions in 2017. Now, if we were to, uh, if the world were to implement a faster transition, if the world were to see that optimality would imply a faster transition than what we have in our simulations, then our models sort of still simply says, look, um, the political economy equilibrium will be even faster than what would be considered optimal. So if everyone would be convinced that optimality would be climate neutrality by 2050, if that were the case, then our guess would be that the political economy would actually have climate neutrality before 2050. Yeah? but I'm not sure whether that's a credible sort of set of parameters. So um, that's on the first question. On the second question on the ETS, um, you say, I say price for that stay, and then you ask, should the price not be even higher to achieve that uh, European climate neutrality? Yes, um, uh, we are both aware of these discussions that, um, there are very different views on the observed prices. Some people say, well, the industry seems not to be worried about the costs uh, of becoming neutral. Maybe it is not that expensive. Others say, so far, the industry did not believe climate policy would be credible in the EU. That was the cause of the low prices. So the high price more or less just reflects increasing credibility. And when over time credibility goes up further, even prices might go up further. Um, I can even predict higher prices because if the real interest stays so low as they currently are, if firms start to believe that the real interest will stay close to zero for the next 30 years, in our ETS market, that should mean that the prices in real terms remain constant. That means practically that the prices should be almost at the level at which we decarbonize. So I would not be surprised if the prices do go up further in the coming months, years, when sort of the market starts to realize that maybe uh, a low interest rate is what we should expect for the future. So uh, it is maybe a bit typical economics arrogance. But my impression is that the ETS is a little bit slow in uh, processing all the information about uh, how it works. Um, uh, so I would not be surprised if prices go up further. 
And I'm actually working with Knutaina Rosendahl and Roveno on, on that idea that you just expressed on the low interest rate. Because I think that's very interesting because if the interest rate really is low, then the market stability reserve starts to behave really weird. <laughs> I think it's very funny, but it's another paper. Now, uh, what if a firm has both dirty and clean energy? Well, the nice part of our model is that we find that that really doesn't matter. So for a firm, there is sort of no competition or the competition is separable, let's say it in that way. A fir the firms don't, uh, you can aggregate, we find that you can aggregate the firm's lobbies or you can separate the firm's lobbies. It does not matter whether you describe them as one unit of energy, both clean and dirty, or that you describe them as a separate clean or a separate dirty, or that you describe them as hundred small firms. In the end, they all produce the same outcome as long as the firm is aware, each firm is aware that he or she cannot drop out of the transfer mechanism because then the whole uh, equilibrium breaks down. And that's part of the truthful equilibrium concept. So um, I think the results are not sensitive to uh, the assumption with that clean and dirty energy sort of are separate firms. There's no need for that in the model. Now, does the choice of utility function affect the results? Sure, uh, that's obvious. It's like in a DICE model, uh, if you have a different utility function, uh, a higher or lower constant elasticity of substitution, it will refract the results. But as uh, a paper by Inge van der Bijgaard, Matti and me, sort of we show how approximately different utility functions with different discount rates sort of map into each other. So it's not that everything changes. It's just if you have a different utility function, you meet a different discount rate. And then results still approximately remain the same. That's what I believe will also hold in this model. So to have the nice analytically tractable results, you need lock utility. But if you would solve the model quantitatively, numerically, you could solve it also with other utility functions. And uh, it would give similar results if you just take the proper combinations of parameters. Great. Thanks a lot. So Thank you. Now uh, we have uh, other questions. The topic of lining firms with social objectives is a very relevant topic in battling climate change. The alignment of the firm's objective with social objectives is a crucial task for policymakers. In your work, it is assumed that the policymaker takes office in one period and becomes a consumer afterwards. Indeed, this assumption might not hold in practice as a policymaker may return to policymaker position after this one period or even take a job at the fossil fuel company. Yes, 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 we've seen that often enough after having been in office. How important is this assumption on the objective for the results? If the policymaker has an objective that accounts for a potential future career in fossil fuels or accounts for some lobbying power by fossil fuels, would it mean the policymaker loses the incentive to change current subsidies or are there other factors that make renewables attractive in the model that I may have missed? So uh, I think you are completely correctly understanding that if the policymaker uh, moves, um, so if the policymaker, there are two separate, I think there's two separate questions here. One is if the policymaker stays in office for longer. Uh, in a certain way, you can capture that by saying it's similar to having longer periods. So it may change. I don't expect that to change much to the results. Now, the second question is what happens if the policymaker expects to become part of the industry? I think in terms of the model that is captured by increasing the CETA that is the efficiency of the transfer from the industry to the policymaker. So my understanding of policymakers becomes obvious afterwards, which you indeed uh, frequently see, is that uh, the industry has a very effective 
transfer channel uh, to reward policymakers, not only in the present, but also informing policymakers that they will be uh, rewarded in the future. So, in my view, the model does capture that phenomenon as an increase, as a higher level of the theta in the model. So, um, I think the model will does capture both the questions. Is what's the dynamics of labor in, in the model? And um, I must admit, it's extremely simple. It is exogenous. So we really have stripped down the model, like all of it all. So, um, and we even stripped it in some ways further by stripping out capital. Uh, and labor just follows an exogenous path. So I do have a paper with um, um, Veronica Lupi and Marcio Galliotti in Italy, where we have endogenous population. So, uh, but like most other sort of um, uh, models in the current paper with Mati, we don't look into population dynamics other than uh, exogenous dynamics. Thank you. And this study, you highlight the behavior of power plants, owners to protect in some sense their past investments, some cost by defending the consequent rent, also by means of special interest. Policymakers are aware of this dynamics and hopefully put their effort in contrasting it. Which are the instruments available for this purpose? Do they have to be addressed in nullifying the pen? Well, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, Nicola, what FEN stands, often investment in dirty power plants, but I'll try to answer it nonetheless. Um, yeah, yeah then, then I think it should be net present value and net present value. Okay. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's an acronym in Italian language. <laughs> so it's very good. Okay. Now, I, to be honest, um, the the point is, uh, there are two different things here. I myself, I'm not so sure that policymakers do anticipate the political economy consequences, also because it may be other policymakers that are confronted with these, with these consequences. I think policymakers are like managers, and I've been a manager myself, and I've been among managers. Managers in the sense of being responsible for a team of people. <laughs> and uh, what I note, is that uh, sort of you have your immediate concerns and you have your future concerns. And part of the future concerns are really happily discounted because you think that's something the next manager will have to sort out. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, uh, from my own practice experience, I think that the description of a one period manager really captures some of what I think I have observed with others and I even have observed this myself. Um, also meaning that so indeed uh, you do not always completely, it's too difficult often to sort of do a second order because what you're writing about, I fully agree it's important, but it's a second order implication. You must foresee that in the future there arises a rent seeking problem. Well, I think policymakers have difficulties foreseeing climate change, you know, while that is in a certain way straightforward. <laughs> Still, they have difficulties to see that. So, I think uh, we don't have many uh, many instruments available. So, we try sometimes. So, for example, if you uh, if uh, when you give firms the uh, the rights to open a new mine for minerals, then we try to have these instruments where firms have already to, uh, to put funds into the deposit for the cleaning up costs. Because experience tells us, empirics tells us that most mining companies sort of at the end leave, uh, leave the waste there without any budget to, well, with, with insufficient budget, I should say, to clean up. Um, so this is an empirically known problem. And we have thought about instruments as environmental economists, like having a deposit. And we know it's extremely difficult to implement that in practice because there's a huge pressure on the current policymaker just to get the mine owner there because it promises current jobs. 
and these cleanup costs, come on, they are there for the future planner. I think that's what we observe in the data. So uh, I think theoretically we can dream up instruments. Practically, they're very hard to implement. So thank you very much. That would be my answer. I hope um, it's okay. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, Reyer, for your time for us. Uh, so you dedicate. If you ask other question, I will send. We will send to you. I would like to thank you, Nicola, for the questions. Uh, Marta, Elenia, and Julia for you know, your management, the management of this. So I would like to thank all the participants, and uh, so I stop here. And uh, thank you again. Good, good, <laughs> good evening. Good luck. Thank you all for joining in. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Presentation. I'll we'll be contact later. Perfect. Bye bye. Thank you.